going to start us off by welcoming everyone to the program. Um, so my name is Angie Grove. I'm the executive director at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. And the Homestead Museum hosts a monthly lecture series. And of course, prior to Zoom or prior to COVID, all of our lecture series were in person here in Burlington, Vermont at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. And then during COVID time, we switched to fully remote on Zoom. Um, and uh, we have this year gone back to fully in person uh, with a few exceptions. And today's uh, program is, is one of those exceptions because we found that when we went fully remote during COVID, it actually opened up the doors for us to host speakers from further away, particularly from international locations, such as from Scotland, which is where your speaker is gonna be coming from today. So um, we are in the winter months while the museum general admission is closed. Um, we are having some of our programs be fully remote and hopefully that will also allow some of our audience members to be from, from a larger and more vast area as well. Now, just so everyone is aware, this program is being recorded. It will be, this recording will be edited by uh, one of our partners in this program, CCTV is a local nonprofit on, uh, for media literacy and the democratization of media. And they will be editing this uh, video and submitting it for our local public television, as well as allowing us to then post it on the YouTube page for the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. So if you have to get out of this program early and you don't catch all of it, or if you have a friend who didn't get a chance to see it, or if you love it so much, you wanna watch it a second time, you can always go back to our YouTube page to watch it from there as well. Okay, so um, I have a couple of announcements just for the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. And then um, we are going to, um, I'm gonna step away so that one of my colleagues can introduce the speaker and then uh, we're gonna go from there. So uh, the few announcements I have, um, I wanna first let everyone know about the last program we have um, for the calendar year coming up. And this is a members only event. So if you are currently not a member of the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum, you can fix that very easily by going to our website to purchase membership online. Um, I do, if you're considering it, I do highly recommend you do it today or, or very soon so that you can catch this members only event coming up but also because the prices for membership are gonna go up in 2024. So lock in your rate now. Um, so coming up, we have on Sunday, December 3rd, um, we have the member only lecture, which is actually gonna be me who's the speaker. And my presentation is titled um, Ethan Allen, Infernal Villain. And you'll have to come to the event to find out more about that. Um, and I will put into the chat box um, in a moment, a link to our website if you were thinking about purchasing membership. So that's our final event coming up for this calendar year. And then um, in January, we will be publishing our event list for 2024, including our speakers for the lecture series, our book club meeting dates and what books we're gonna be reading in 2024, as well as other special events like reenactment events in the summer and the spring as well. Okay. Uh, I also want to really quickly give a shout out to the sponsors of our community enrichment programs at the Homestead Museum. So we have uh, the support and sponsorship of some local companies, including M&T Bank, North Country Federal Credit Union, and AARP Vermont. Without their sponsorship, we would not be able to bring these programs to you, and particularly our monthly lecture series, we wouldn't be able to bring it to you for free without their community investment in our programs and in our mission. So thank you to our sponsors as well. Okay, um, logistically, I'm gonna ask that everyone stay muted um, except for our speaker. You can have your camera on, you can have your camera off at your discretion and your comfort level, but do be aware that it is being recorded. So if you have your camera on, your visuals will be recorded in the recording as well. And so we get to the very end for Q&A. And when we open up the floor for Q&A, 
then as we call on people, you can unmute and also turn on your camera if you're comfortable with that. While our speaker is presenting, if you have a burning question that you don't want to forget and you want to put it into the chat box, you can send it directly to um, either uh, myself, uh, my profile is Angie Grove, comma, Ethan Allen Homestead, or my colleague, John, who's in the profile that's just called Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. So you can send questions to, to either one, um, or you can um, uh, save your question and then you can raise your hand or indicate that you'd like to ask a question at the end and we can call on you and you can ask a question in person. Okay. So I think I've gone over everything I need to go over. And now I'm going to step away so that our my colleague, Zachary Bennett, can introduce our speaker today. I just, yep, I see that Zach is here. So um, I'm going to mute myself and let Zach take over. OK, it's me. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I'm I'm Zachary Bennett. I'm a, a professor of uh, history at Norwich University. I study uh, and write about early American history, and I'm very excited to be attending this talk with you by Benjamin Anderson, The Fluidity of Allegiance in Revolutionary Vermont. And what I'm going to do is just kind of provide a little bit of an introduction of where um, Mr. Anderson's work kind of is situated with within the larger work that historians are doing about the American Revolution right now, because we're we're hearing about some pretty cutting edge research, which is which is always awesome. Um, so Benjamin Anderson will be talking about shifting pol political allegiances in Vermont, once part of New York, arguably part of New Hampshire, uh, once part of the Wabanaki Dawnland, part of the United States, then its own indep independent republic for a while, and almost part of Canada. Um, so political allegiance, understandably, was uh, very complicated in this part of the world in the late 18th century. Um, and Anderson will help us understand the motivations be behind those shifting allegiances. Um, Benjamin Anderson's research is part of a larger historiographical turn, broadly known as the transnational turn or the global turn. Um, this school of historians look at the American Revolution from a more global perspective and have turned our attention away from familiar folks like uh, the Founding Fathers, uh, to people who lived on the borders of the American Revolution um, or beyond, so Native Americans, Loyalists, these type of people. Uh, these scholars have taken seriously the experiences of the losers of the American Revolution, such as African Americans, uh, Loyalists, and, and Native Americans, uh, and have felt that including their perspectives, other than a nice thing to do, is essential for understanding what the American Revolution was all about. Um, and one of the ways you can see this is uh, in the last two decades, some of the most important books that have come out on the American Revolution have titles like this, um, Independence Lost, Lives on the Edge of the American Revolution, uh, American Revolutions, A Continental History, um, the first book, Independence Lost, is by Kathleen Duvall, if you're interested. It's very good. American Revolutions is by Alan Taylor, which I think is the best synthesis of the revolution currently out. And then finally, another book to give you a sense of how historians are approaching this period is uh, by Maya Jasinoff, Liberty's Exiles, American Loyalists in the Revolutionary World, right? So it's kind of focusing on the losers, the people who weren't as successful, and also understanding how the American Revolution was actually part of a, a, a global, it was really a global conflict rather than one that just happened within the borders of, of the you know good old US of A. Um, so Vermont was certainly on the edge of the American Revolution um, and has not been really explored really in depth since really the 80s or 90s. So um, Anderson's work is, is much uh, anticipated and it's, it's filling a gap in the research. And I, I'm hoping that um, and I hope when you listen to this presentation as well, that he, uh, Anderson's research doesn't just help us understand about what happened in Vermont, but in a wider sense, how Vermont and the experiences ha that happened here, which were very weird and exceptional in some ways, help us understand what the American Revolution meant, not just for the United States, not just for North America, uh, but what uh, the American Revolution's impact had on the, the, the wider world. Okay, so... A little bit of a bio biographical uh, background on our speaker. Um, 
Benjamin Anderson was born and bred in Fife, Scotland. Uh, Benjamin earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Stirling and his postgraduate degree at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. He is now studying for his PhD at the University of Edinburgh on Vermont and Revolutionary America. I mean, it's, I think it's always awesome, right, when we have people who look at our revolution from different parts of the world, right? It's a different kind of uh, lens on it. Um, in his spare time, he enjoys hiking with his dog in Scotland, uh, hence for his love for Vermont and its mountains. He is a supporter of the East Fife Football Club, who I noticed beat Clyde 4-0 today, so congratulations on that, Ben. Uh, um, little just kind of personal thing, um, I met Ben on Twitter, actually, because uh, historians are... It's kind of uh, as historians, it's kind of great for us to be on Twitter because we can be around people who are as interested in the kind of niche things, niche things that, not, that we are. And I kind of found this Benjamin Anderson person, this young uh, graduate student who was obsessed with Vermont in the American Revolution in Scotland. And I thought, wow, that's pretty uh, interesting and neat. And when he was in Vermont, I was able to meet him in Burlington. And when I was doing research um, in London two years ago, I was able to um, meet meet up with him, so it's it's been it's been nice to find a scholar of the American Revolution who's interested in this part of the world and interested in Vermont and have a kind of transnational scholarly relationship like that. So, anyways, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Mr. Anderson, and uh, I look forward, as I hope the rest of you do, to his talk. Thank you, Zach. Hey, can you make sure everyone can hear me all right? Is that good? Yeah. Fantastic. That is a fantastic mustache you have there as well. Absolutely loving it. Fantastic. Um, but yeah, thank you for the introduction, Zach, and thank you for everyone for coming along today to listen to me waffle on about my research on Vermont and revolutionary America. Um, thank you also to the Ethan Allen Homestead and Angie uh, for organising this event. Um, so yeah, I look forward to any questions and observations you may have at the end. Of course, this is a, a PhD project and PhD projects are always a work in progress um, and I'm always open to feedback or whatever you have for me. I'd like to think that my project challenges the Vermont historiography, uh, which kind of looks at Vermont as a, a bastion of patriot support. Uh, I don't disagree with the assertion that Vermont supported the patriots more than the loyalists, but I do believe that the feeling only extended so far. Um, and it's more this idea of localism that we see across America, but especially on the outskirts, um, as, as Zach was saying, where we end up seeing on the edge, people kind of go in their own way, uh, as, we, as we'll see as we go through this uh, with other states. Um, so yeah, and it's the more to see the, the limits of national identity and nationalism during the revolutionary era. Um, and just a point of... Um, a point to note is that Vermont, uh, to begin with, will be referred to as the New Hampshire Grants, because that is the name it was, uh, prior to its Declaration of Independence in 1777. So I'd like to start this presentation... Oh, there we go. I'd like to start this presentation by considering the word that's currently on your screen. Um, country, I believe, uh, perfectly captures the mentality of people in the early modern period. Although the word possesses a relative flexibility about it in today's usage, it's typically used to affect a nation. Um, but back in the early modern period, it was used more to describe a region, a state, colony or county, as the definition suggests. And it, it kind of takes on a meaning of nation as we kind of progress through the early modern period. But to begin with, it was really to do with the region, as it says. And so in this period, localism and local identity rather than national identity and nationalism were the potent focuses, uh, potent forces. The word was widely used in this context by numerous leading figures from Vermont, such as Ethan Allen um, and Thomas Chittenden, who was the first governor of Vermont. But you could also see it being used across the continent by the likes of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, where they refer to Virginia and their region as their country. And you can see a couple of examples on your screen there of where it's been used by Vermont, by New Hampshire Grant Settlers in 1767 for this petition here, and also by Ira Allen, the younger brother of Ethan Allen, um, and one of his pamphlets here. Um, so what is localism? And 
unfortunately for me, localism is a problematic concept uh, because of its flexibility. Localism can be confined to a scale as small as your street to as large as your region. I've ident tried to identify three strands of localism to try and help me make sense of the complex nature of revolutionary Vermont and, Vermont and the Northern Frontier, as, as Zach outlined at the start. So firstly, we have the micro-localism, which represents the towns and small communities that have dispersed across the Northern Frontier during the 18th century. We then have the meso-localism, which is the colony, which then becomes the state. And then we have macro-localism of the region, in this case, New England. And they, are, they kind of like strands in a rope. The free localism, they're intertwined and they strengthen the localist mentality as a whole. Now, of course, as I've said, localism, it, was, it wasn't confined to Vermont. It, it was evident across North America. And by understanding this mentality, it can help us to explain the emergence of other separatist states like those shown on the slide of Franklin, which is modern day Tennessee's, and Transylvania, which is modern day Kentucky and all the they're getting into Tennessee's there. So kinship, family and friends, political and cultural identities, economics and history, these all helped contribute towards a sense of localism. The micro-localism contained the immediate community who were connected by their shared experience of chain migration and settling and defending their land titles from encroaching Yorkers, or in the case of the Yorkers and the New Hampshire Grants, defending themselves from the quote, the Bennington mob of Ethan Allen and his um, associates. The meso and the macro localisms, however, were more imagined communities, people that lived beyond the immediate vicinity of um, the smaller communities, and they were linked by a heritage, culture, religion, and political beliefs. For the colonists, allegiance, it seems in the, this era, operated on two levels. On the most important immediate level was their allegiance to their state or colony that provided them with their political voice and safeguarded their properties and liberties. And it was also where they came into daily contact with. To protect one's state was an act of mesolocalism that in New England had fundamental consequences for the micro-localism because the two were so intertwined, especially in Vermont. Simultaneously, they also paid allegiance to a higher authority first the British Empire and then the United States of America. And this made them part of a wider network of defense against foreign enemies, as well as allowed them to have trading partners across the world and across the North American continent. Allegiance to the latter seems to be, uh, it only went so far it was able to protect their local needs. And when they started to encroach on their liberties and properties, then they started to look elsewhere for protection whether that be to the United States, back to the British Empire, or in the case of Vermont, even to themselves. Localism therefore transcended nationalism in the revolutionary era. People were much more concerned about the issues in their local communities, their states or colony uh, or region than they were about the ongoing battle between the US and the British Empire. If one looks at the town records in Vermont, for example, then one can see very little reference to the Revolutionary War during that period. You'll get the odd mention talking about, for example, Ebenezer Allen, Ethan Allen's cousin, going away to another town to pick up ammunition. Um, but there's, there's not much more than that. Concerns on a local level were numerous, and motivation for how one acted could change with new developments politically and militarily. So we have... I have a list here. We have Vermonters who are looking to create their own state and then they're securing it, which in turn allowed them to secure their own land. We have conservative New Yorkers in Vermont looking to preserve New York's jurisdiction. While well, some New Hampshire rights were looking for a political voice, namely over the east of, over the east of the Connecticut River, others were looking for protection from a conservative New York constitution that seemed to be at odds with this New England way. We then have New, New Yorkers west of Lake Champlain, feeling neglected by the New York government and left at the mercy of the ravages of war. So they're looking for defence. New Yorkers in Vermont eventually grown disillusioned with New York and the Continental Congress's inability to protect them from the Vermont government. And it is even possible to extend the analysis into the northwest of Massachusetts, 
where Berkshire constitutionalists pushed back against the Massachusetts Constitution and even led Ethan Allen to ponder annexing the county to a greater Vermont. This multitude of motivations comes the fluidity of allegiance that stressed the localist mentality of the local colonists and early US citizens. So again, we'll rattle them off a wee list. We have New Hampshireites becoming Vermonters, New Hampshireites becoming New Yorkers, New Yorkers becoming New Hampshireites, New Yorkers becoming Vermonters. In one instance, one small group of, uh, of New Yorkers become Massachusetts and then revert back to New York. Uh, we have for Native Americans, Abenakis, the little few number, they jumped on uh, between the Patriots and the Loyalists. We see this amongst the white population as well, as people, Patriots become Loyalists, Loyalists become Patriots. In the story of Thomas Johnson, which Angie covered in her dissertation, uh, which is a very enjoyable read, we have a Patriot that became a Loyalist and then supposedly reverted back to being a Patriot. And in some cases, we see movement on both levels, on a state level and on this higher level, national level. And my personal favourite is Peter Olcott of Norwich, New Hampshire. So we have this New York sympathiser who then asked for New Hampshire to annex part or, or, or part of or all of Vermont whilst he sat in the Vermont General Assembly. He also served at the battles of Bennington and Saratoga as a patriot, but he was described in one piece of correspondence, quote, as a friend to government or Tories and a royalist. That guy in particular stressed me out because I was trying to figure out what was going on with him. Um, so from there, boundaries, uh, boundaries in colonial North America were nebulous. And they were a key reason why we see so much fluid allegiance on the northern frontier and such a strong localist mentality. Under King George the Third reign, hazy border set colonies against one another, encouraged macro locus macro, macro sentiment as cultures clashed, i.e. New Yorkers versus New Englanders, micro localist feelings as small communities banded together to beat back external colonial authorities that claimed jurisdiction over their land, and meso-localism as colonies um, competed with one another for the king's approval in establishing their jurisdiction and over ownership over land that lay on disputed territories. And you can see by the quote on your, your screen here by Andrew Burnaby, he was a, a, a minister from England who travelled, traversed the North American continent in 1759 to 1760 and took in all the different colonies, looked at the different societies, and generally came to the conclusion of this all these different localities who were just completely at odds with one another. And as he says, even the limits and boundaries of each colony are a constant source of litigation. So as the story of the boundary dispute between New York, New Hampshire, and New Hampshire Grant settlers has been told so often, I'll just recite the salient facts. Um, without a doubt, Benning Wentworth, the royal governor of New Hampshire, was perhaps as greedy and corrupt as they came. This indebted merchant took advantage of the nebulous borders that characterised colonial America to make a quick buck for himself. So he cited the Connecticut River from 1749 onwards. It was a bold move that directly challenged New York, who exhorted him. New York claimed the land belonged to them because a 1664 patent from King Charles II to the Duke of York, his brother, extended to the western bank of the Connecticut River, which was at New York. Although New York and the Board of Trade warned Wentworth not to issue any more grants, he continued to do so until the Seven Years' War outbreak in 1756. Wentworth benefited immensely from the speculative frenzy that overtook the colonists after the Seven Years' War, with as many as 20,000 people moving into the New Hampshire grants by the start of the Revolutionary War. Cadwallader Colden, who would serve as the governor of New York on multiple occasions, was unhappy with Wentworth's conduct. He reported the matter to George III, who determined in 1764 that New York's boundary ran to the western bank of the Connecticut. Far from clearing up the mess, George actually made it even worse. He failed to validate or void the settlers' land grants from New Hampshire. His use of the phrase to be the boundary um, was used by both sides of the debate. On hand, the New Yorkers argued this showed the border had always ran to the western bank of the Connecticut. 
On the other hand, the Grant settlers claimed it showed the land previously belonged to New York, New Hampshire, thus their land grant were valid. With the 1764 proclamation, New York decided to issue their own land grant that subsequently overlapped with the land grants from New Hampshire only adding further confusion to the situation. They also demanded the settlers pay a second quit-rent fee to secure their land, which infuriated the settlers and led them on, led those, especially on the west side of the Green Mountains, to petition George III for relief from encroaching Yorker officials who ran lines on their land. Samuel Robinson, who was sort of the leader, I would say, in the Western New Hampshire grants prior to Ethan Allen, travelled to London in 1767, and he requested George IV to validate their lands and annex them to whatever state. Robinson died whilst in London, which eventually led, which led the leadership by void on the grants, and George IV eventually demanded New York stop issuing land grants until he had made his final decision on the matter. The struggle for this region, uh, the, new, the northern frontier, where the borders were very hazy indeed, indeed, New York... Some New York believed that their jurisdiction actually extended to just short of the St. Lawrence River in uh, Canada. Um, and the struggle for the region was symptomatic of the meso-localism within the colonies during the 18th century. And it serves as, a, as an excellent example of the divisions that King George III, whether by design or accident, created by Stoke and localism. Nobody, like I said, nobody was entirely sure about the, the border. Um, New Hampshire Grants and New York's uh, New Yorkers appealed to the king by arguing why the land was important for the king's own interest. Both sought to portray themselves as able to financially benefit the king through their hard work or their business savvy. The settlers, however, also appeared to the British strategy of depositing colonists on the, the border to protect the seaboard from Native American threats and foreign imperial enemies. They depict themselves as these gritty, skilled gunmen who would fight and die for their king. Further, they sought to portray the New Yorkers as less loyal than themselves because they continued to issue land grants against the king's wishes. They made this grittiness pretty clear through the Green Mountain Boys in their campaign of terror against Yorkers on the New Hampshire grants. And of course, no story of Vermont can be told um, without Ethan Allen. This man um, who I've likened to the William Wallace of Vermont. He's, he's this mythical figure who certainly lived, but there's no no enduring image, no image of him, physical image. Um, so you're left to use your imagination, which he enjoyed also doing. Um, so he came from Litchfield, Connecticut and possessed a controversial reputation. He'd been kicked out of towns um, for his behaviour and he criticised Christianity. As a teenager, he was forced to deal with the death of his father and to forgo, his, forgo, for, forgo further education to look after his family and the farm. This never stopped him, however, from aspiring to become a philosophical gentleman, and the Grant settler struggle gave him an outlet to express himself. He appeared in the Grants in the 1760s and discovered the vast amount of untapped land that he could speculate. From a young age, his father had drilled it into him that land speculation was a good way to accumulate wealth. And if the accumulation of wealth could secure the family for future generations, it was a traditional New England way of thinking. With his brothers and cousin, he created the Onion River Land Company and accumulated 75,000 acres of western land by 1775. Protection of his investment and family became closely tied to the settlers' mission to validate their lands. With so much land and little money, Allen could not afford to pay a second quit rent like many of the other settlers slash speculators that lived in the Grants. Allen came to represent the New Hampshire Grant settlers in the ejectment trials of 1770 and 1771, a series of trials in the New York Supreme Court between the Yorker landowners and the New Hampshire Grant settlers. The court ruled in favour of the landowners and the settlers faced ejectment from their land. In the aftermath, Ethan founded the famous Green Mountain Boys, who spent the next few years terrorising Yorker officials, farmers and settlers in the grants. Such an example of their tactics was that of, Sir, of Dr Samuel Adams in Arlington, as pictured on this slide. He was tied to a chair and hanged from the sign of the Catamount Tavern because he was encouraging settlers to pay the second quit rent. 
As he terrorised the Yorkers, Allen used the press to attack Governor William Tryon and the Yorkers. He accused the New Yorkers of attempting to enslave and impoverish settlers. He used the similar Lockean philosophy that we see across North America at the time by arguing the land belonged to the man who tilled it, and he depicted the struggle as one of class, the peasant the grants versus the great gentleman landowners of New York. On a number of occasions throughout the 1770s, he would argue Vermont had reverted into a state of nature, thus the settlers owned the land. With time, he would eventually become the spokesperson of for, for the state, or the colony of the state. It was a common role that we see evolving in other self-erected states in North America, such as Franklin and Kentucky, where one individual seems to place themselves at the head of the state, and a lot of the population respect the position. This person then becomes a focal point that offers direction in the population struggle against a league of gentlemen that they perceive to be in the state that they are attempting to separate from, and the Continental Congress. Allen and the Green Mountain Boys' actions made the dividing lines more distinct between the different factions. Those in the West would be, I would call them, it's the separatists, um, and they would be the Vermonters, those in the centre of your screen. Um, over time, and with men in Bennington, Allen created a clique called the Arlington Junto. This group included Thomas Chittenton, his youngest brother, Ira Allen, Moses Robinson, Joseph Fay, John Fassett Jr., Timothy Brownson, and Samuel Safford. Chittenton would serve as a governor of Vermont from 1777 to 1790. Only a technicality would prevent him from sitting in 1791, and he would return from 1791 to his death in 1797. Ira Allen served on the governor and council. He was treasurer, a surveyor general. Robinson, Vermont Supreme Court judge and member of the Governor Council, who would take Chittenton's place in 1791. Um, Joseph A. sat on the Governor and Council. He was Secretary of State. John Fassett Jr., again, Governor and Council, and a member of the Vermont Supreme Court. There were other factions in the West who disagreed with the boys' methods, such as James Breckenridge and Jaheel Hawley, who preferred to use petitions to secure their land, and they coincidentally tended to go to Loyalists. Geo Hawley would eventually join Burgoyne at, uh, Tocondero, at Crown Point or Ticonderoga, and James Breckenridge would sort of kind of remain on his land and be kind of known as a Loyalist. Uh, but because of his connections with, uh, with Ethan Allen, he would generally not receive harassment. Others in the grants were more conservative socially and religiously, and they tarred the West Sider with the same brush by believing him to be like Allen a dangerous anti-Christian riotous man. Naturally, as the chief target of the Green Mountain Boys, Yorkers were scathing about them, and part of their low opinion of the boys could also be attributed to the enmity that existed between New Yorkers and New Englanders because of their different political cultures, the macro-localist strand. While some settlers across the Grants took New York up on the quit rents, the Yorkers were largely confined to Cumberland County in the southeast. In my mind, these type of people were the kind that would have been in Boston in, in the 1760s and would be concerned by the mob's destruction of Thomas Hutchinson's house. There were exceptions, like Nathan Stone, who attempted to shut down a court in 71 and chased a Yorker lawyer called John Grout out of Windsor. His and his posse's behaviour showed a dislike amongst the East Siders for lawyers and attorneys, who in Cumberland County were rumoured to be just as corrupt as Benning Wentworth. Most Yorkers, however, created law and order, repeatedly petitioning the New York authorities for a court in the region to deal with local criminals because it was too, flaw too far to take prisoner to Albany in New York or Portsmouth in New Hampshire. The leading Yorkers in the East were the Chandler family, Samuel Wells, Green Brush, Charles Phelp and Daniel Whipple, who were all either attorneys, judges or a sheriff. Charles Felt was a curious case, regarded by many as a pain in the neck. He supported New York, and then when he feared for his land and feared that New York wasn't going, this, wasn't going the way of the Patriots, he petitioned Massachusetts to claim ownership of the region before he returned to being in Vermont, before he returned to being a New Yorker again. He'd be a constant thorn in Vermont's side until his death. Eventually, the Vermont authorities got, to, got him to pledge allegiance to the state in his old age, but in one final act of resistance, and after his death in the 1780s, he um, proclaimed in his will that he was really a Yorker. 
Cream Brush served in the Provincial Congress and was a loyalist who tried to prevent communication between the Congress and local Committee of Safety in Cumberland. He eventually ended up in New York and committed suicide before the start of the war. Samuel Wells served alongside the Brush, but he would end up aligning himself with the Vermonters and serving an important role in the Haldeman negotiations as a letter carrier. The Continental Congress demanded his arrest, but he remained a free man. Indeed, I believe Ethan Allen and uh, some of his co and his associates actually warned him about potential arrest by the, the Continental Congress authorities, and they eventually moved to Canada. In conjunction with Lowe's in the East, we also have the New Yorkers in the West, as I mentioned earlier, who actually resided in New York and petitioned to join the state of Vermont in 1781. They were accepted and formed the Western Union in Greater Vermont until 1782. This group has proved to be a bit more mysterious so far. What I can say is that they felt neglected by the New York authorities, especially on military matters, because they faced continual threats from the Native Americans. It may very well be that they were also New Englanders who had maybe moved northwards to secure land for their family survival, much like the Allens. We then have the New Hampshire Rights, who typically New Hampshire Rights, who typically resided along both sides of the Connecticut River. Trade and origins led populations on either side to form a strong bond, and, and times on either side would actually share ministers. Jeremy Belknap, the New Hampshire historian, recalled, before the revolution, the people of different parts of New Hampshire had but little connection with, with each other. Like the Yorkers, they were religiously conservative, and they viewed the West Siders with suspicion. It was a key reason why the group's leader, Jacob Bailey, hesitated to get in bed with Ethan Allen, despite much overtures from those in the West. Equally important in this group was Bezalel Woodward, Elijah Payne, and John Wheelock, son of Eliza Wheelock, who ran Dartmouth College in the town of Hanover. They hoped to secure the college's future and grew increasingly weary of New York's political leaders over time. The population east of the Connecticut River felt neglected by the New Hampshire politics and the politicians and they believed they weren't properly represented. They denounced the property qualifications for those wanting to be in the legislature, they didn't like the fact that the New Hampshire Constitution didn't contain a Bill of Rights, and they also didn't like the fact the seat of government was in Exeter, and it was too far away. They demanded a new constitution and the seat of government be moved to the centre of the state. In March 78, 16 New Hampshire towns requested Vermont annex them, which Vermont agreed to do after a referendum. This initial Eastern Union, however, only lasted a matter of months. Fearing the consequences of Congress and losing one of the biggest allies in New Hampshire, the Vermont General Assembly dissolved the Union. Towns on either side of the Connecticut then met on multiple occasions, and different plans were formed that once again reflected the sense of localism. They asked New Hampshire to annex Eastern Vermont to the state, and at one point they even proposed the creation of a new state between the towns on either side of the river. In 1781, Vermont once again annexed towns east of the river, this time it amounted to 43 towns. But once more, the Union was short-lived, and Vermont dissolved the Union in 82, as the threat of war between New Hampshire and Vermont slowly rose, and George Washington suggested that if Vermont relinquished both unions, then they may be accepted into the United States. When the Westsiders attempted to engineer the creation of a new state in 1776, a series of conventions, the East Siders were predominantly absent. Only one East Side town sent a delegate to the Dorset Convention in 76, where an association asked inhabitants to give themselves to the cause of the United American States and the creation of a war commission. At the Westminster Convention on 15th of January 1777, when the New Hampshire Grants declared itself independent, there were more East Side towns than West Side ones. Charles Minor Thompson argues the location of the convention was purposefully placed in the East to encourage more Eastsiders to attend and thus provide a greater show of unity towards independence. Only 11 Eastside towns attended the convention, but the Constitutional Convention in July showed a stark increase in numbers amongst Eastsiders. So what was the key reason perhaps for this? the Constitution of New York, which has served as a pivotal turning point, as well as the Constitution of New Hampshire, and led the people in the East to turn away towards the Vermont state. The conservative New York Constitution kept primogeniture and entail, 
like the, the New Hampshire Constitution, it did not contain a Bill of Rights. Uh, it also had a strong executive that could prorogue the legislature, and strict property qualifications remained, which would have disenfranchised many. To the set to the Vermonters, the separatists like the Allens, it was a godsend who printed the document and dispersed it across the East. In January 77, Bailey condemned the Westminster Convention in a letter to the New York Provincial Congress, and he proclaimed, I do not look on myself as a member of any state but New York, but his tune changed by the summer. He wrote to the New York Council of Safety, I am apt to think our people will not choose any members to sit in the state of New York. The people before they saw the Constitution were not willing to trouble themselves about a separation from the state of New York, but now, almost to a man, they are violent for it. The Vermont Constitution of 1777 uh, um, was not the Pennsylvania Constitution and appealed a lot more to them. In early July 1777, 50 delegates from 31 towns gathered in Windsor at a con con constitutional convention. The document received its last reading on the 8th of July, just as news spread the war defeat at the Battle of, Ticondero of, Battle of Hubberton and Fort Ticonderoga's fall. Written by Thomas Chittenden and Ira Allen, the preamble attacked New York for neglect of the population and the people were left with no option but to create their own government for, quote, the security and protection of the community. The Constitution safeguarded basic rights, right to a fair trial by jury, right to form a new government, right to freedom of press, speech and public assembly, right to religious freedom within reason, and also slavery was outlawed, but people still had, there were still loopholes people found to get around that. You could see there was a local mentioned to this whole constitution that was rooted in the micro-localism of the town, which formed the centre of the political system. It was in these meet these town meetings that members to the unicameral legislature were elected, and it was through these meetings that approval was given for the constitutional convention because Vermont lacked a legislature, which suggests it was a true reflection of the people's political principles. The General Assembly was composed of representatives of each town, the number differing by the size of the town. The governor was a cabinet with positions such as the governor, treasurer, treasurer, secretary of state, and so on. You could hold multiple roles in government, but you were at the mercy of the people for everything. Every position was up for election. The voting system reverted to a traditional New England style of town meetings, which differed from the New York system of county representation and the proportional representation of Pennsylvania. Further, there was no property qualification, unlike New Hampshire, who demanded a poll tax. In Vermont, one had to be a male and over 21 to vote. The Constitution also imposed community-oriented rules. The state was allowed to confiscate people's effects for the, for the war effort, and the people would be reimbursed for their troubles, thus kind of bringing people closer together and making them all part of this one mission. This fed into the confiscation and sequestration process that was about to unfold against the New Yorkers and the Loyalists. As the Constitutional Convention took place, General John Burgoyne uh, and the British Army snaked through Western Vermont, which alarmed the delegates in Windsor. Typically, the New Hampshire Grant settlers are portrayed as a patriot stronghold. Until 1775, however, there was little of any mention in the region of the ongoing imperial crisis between the colonies and Britain. It was Ethan Allen, the Green Mountain Boys, and troops from Connecticut with Benedict Arnold, who struck one of the first blows to Britain in the Revolutionary War by sacking Fort Ticonderoga. And Ethan Allen was, on appearance, as patriotic as it came when it concerned the USA. How far was this true? Certainly, the New Hampshire Grant Settlers expressed their opposition to Britain in 1775, as local committees of safety issued their own commitment to the Continental Congress in the wake of the Battle of Lexington and Concord. Yet Allen admitted in 76, quote, the old farmers on the New Hampshire Grants were not inclined to go to war. In that same year, only 244 men joined Seth Warner's Green Mountain Boys Regiment, which meant he achieved less than half his allocated number of 500. Out of a population of 17,000 to, to 20,000, an estimated 1,500 served in the Continental Army, which represents about 7.5 to 8% of the population. I'm more than happy for you to correct me on that if I'm wrong, because I'm terrible at maths. 
Um, and of course, not every single one of the Grant's inhabitants were eligible to serve in the war. When John Burgoyne thrust down western Vermont on his way to Saratoga in 77, he was also able to call upon an estimated 1,500 people, namely in western Vermont and in northern New York. Whilst the region's leading figures advocated the invasion of Quebec, which aroused suspicion amongst outside figures, who accused them of holding Ticonderoga and Crown Point as, quote, security to their land, Allen and Seth Warner mustered few men. When Allen was captured at Montreal in 75, his force consisted of 25 New Englanders and 85 Canadians. In 76, Warner commanded 170 men, who were largely for Connecticut and Allen, the Quebec invasion, and 350 men at Long Yule, who again were largely from Connecticut. He was also accused of exaggerating his figures and receiving more bounty money as a result. When Burgoyne was based at Ticonderoga, it was not uncommon for people to join the British. 400 people met at Castleton to pledge allegiance to the British, but also that they were not willing to get involved in the fighting. Two high-profile Green Mountain boys, Justice Sherwood and William Marsh, also jumped ship after Ticonderoga. In his plea to New Hampshire for more men, Ira, Ira Allen acknowledged, quote, that many more have taken protection of the British. Governor Morris complained about Philip Skeen, another leading figure in the Western New Hampshire grants, of, quote, court courting Vermonters with golden offers of validating their land. When it came to the militia, however, men signed up in their droves. The urge to sign up for a militia rather than the Continental Army doesn't suggest an antipathy towards the Patriots, but it does that there was a matter as to how far the Vermonters would support the cause. It implies there was a, susp a suspicion of outsiders, an intense localism, especially when one of the outsiders and the leading figures of the Northern Army was the New Yorker Philip Schuyler. The Yorker, meanwhile, demonstrated that dedication to a state could take precedent over the national struggle, for they would refuse to serve for local militia and could buy their way out of selection with £18 or a cow. This happened in 79 when the Continental Army asked for the militia to defend the frontier and one group refused, which led to two cows being seized and the New York mob freeing them in protest against, quote, the pretended state of Vermont. An analysis of how Vermont dealt with its loyalists further weakens the argument that this was a bastion of Patriot support. The brainchild of Ira Allen to pay for new state's expenses, confiscation and sequestration courts were created on both sides of the Green Mountains in 1777. They targeted loyalists and Yorkers by using the vague description, quote, enemies of the state. A few loyalists were in fact targeted by it, and it was primarily Yorkers who felt the brunt of the process. Indeed, after it went upon Ethan Allen's return from captivity, there was one incident where I believe it was about 18 Yorkers were rounded up and taken to Albany to be imprisoned for being loyalists. When they arrived in Albany, the Yorkers told the New York um, authorities that they were not loyalists, they were just New Yorkers. Um, although one loyalist was hanged um, in the state, there were rare instances of aggression against loyalists. Typically, they were fined and forced to stay on their properties until a decision had been made, or they'd pay the fine. In one instance, a town requested the cessation of the process of sequestration and confiscation. If you were a loyalist and knew someone in high places, then you could risk persecution. Samuel Weld's the perfect example. He was a loyalist who ended up in the Vermont General Assembly. A number of other reputed loyalists, with Matthew Leon, Luke Knowlton, and Mika Townsend, who achieved high positions in Vermont politics. Indeed, Matthew Leon would become a very well-known figure in the late 1790s and 1800s um, as part of the uh, Fed, um, Federalists, the, the Jefferson Republicans. In 1779, the government passed a Banishment Act, but then a year later repealed the Act and allowed the Royalists to, Royalists to return if they pleased. It was a policy to forgive and forget from the Vermonters. And Colonel Peter Alcock complained to the Council of Safety in 77. Several, he complained, several of my men deserted over to the enemy after being drafted to go to Ticonderoga. We're gone about one month and returned. The question is, what must be done with these men? Ira Allen replied that they should be reintegrated into society, so long as they were willing to fight for the state. 
assistance say that Vermont or for Patriot supporters and loyalists, say sympathizers. Rather, again, I think that their support had their limits, and those limits involved the state and their local community. The survival of the state was of the greatest importance, and if the survival of the state meant the survival of their land. And if this meant getting along with the supposed enemy, then so be it. In the years that followed, Vermont would become known for the arrival of loyalist refugees and deserters. Uh, one famous quote by George Washington, which will appear later on, um, and is quite well known amongst Vermonters, especially in the archives. And few Vermonters appeared to complain about their arrival. Ira Allen would encourage loyalist merchants and they would take up land in northern Vermont. Ethan Allen suggested support for the Patriots was as much self-interest as it was about showing loyalty to the brethren in New England and the other states. The Vermonters hoped, he said, that by carrying out their duty for the continent, the Continental Congress would reward them by recognising their land titles and accepting the state into the Union. However, this acceptance was not forthcoming. Far from accepting it, the Congress appeared to actually abandon the northern frontier. Initially, it took cannon from Ticonderoga, much to Allen's annoyance, and later refused the Vermonters access to the Continental Army Arsenal in Bennington. Petition after petition for acceptance to the Union was refused by the Continental Congress, and the cannon was completely kicked down the road, which started to inspire a sense of disillusionment amongst Vermonters. Rather than recognising them, Congress appeared to actually be gearing up to decimate it in the event of a US victory, for it requested New Hampshire and Massachusetts to submit their claims to the land. It seemed that enemies lay on every side of Vermont, and so in stepped Britain and Frederick Haldimand. Now, I won't go into too much detail about the Haldimand negotiations. Uh, once more, they have been covered in extensive detail by Vermont historians through the ages, and as, as I'll make clear later, the, the opinion on them differ very wildly between historians. The British had kept track of the land dispute for some time, of course, because they were the, the supreme authority. They were the ones that were to deal with the issue as a whole between New York and New, Ham and, um, New Hampshire. But after defeat in 1777 at Saratoga, it attempted a new method of bribing different states and individuals to rejoin the empire in order to divide the states. It saw the sense of localism that was in America at the time, and it sought to use it to its advantage. He approached Ethan Allen in 79 and offered him everything that the Vermonter, Vermonters wanted if they'd returned to the British Empire. Land validation, free trade with Canada, recognition of Vermont's government, and protection from the US by British troops. Over the course of 79 to 81, Allen and Junto, in the shape of Ira Allen and Joseph Fay, negotiated with the British. The Neg negotiations have caused much debate amongst historians, while some claim the negotiations were, in, uh, were genuine. Others have insisted that they were merely a ploy to stop an invasion by the British and keep the US interested in Vermont, and possibly bait the Continental Congress into accepting Vermont into the Union. Personally, I think the negotiations started off as a possible ploy to get into the Union, but as time passed and acceptance looked increasingly remote, the Junto were genuine in their negotiations. This could be backed up by the fact that they wrote two letters, one to Congress saying negotiations were a ploy, and another to the British stipulating that they were genuine in their attempts. For the passage of time, Frederick Haldimand and Justice Sherwood, who were the two leading figures for Britain in negotiations and rendezvous, believed Vermont was just playing for time. The fact that the members of the Junto continued to pepper Haldimand into the 1780s, requesting access for, to Quebec for free trade, and claiming Vermont was ready to join the British Empire again, suggests that they were also genuine. And so what did the Vermonters think about these, these intrigues? Ethan Allen admits that he feared what would happen if the Vermonters would find out about these secret negotiations. I get the impression however he spoke for many when he and Chittenden made it clear in pamphlets and correspondence that they were acting with pure self-preservation, as, as the quote on your screen suggests. In reality, negotiations were not that much of a secret, in my opinion. Rumours in Vermont swirled about the negotiations, they appeared in a newspaper as far away as London, and they were talked about in Albany. It seemed like quite a few people actually knew about them. Ethan Allen resigned his position in the militia in protest as the Gen General Assembly asked him questions 
about the rendezvous with the British and denounced him for his traitorous ways. Yeah, it seemed that there was a degree of disillusionment across Vermont uh, with the Union, and Al might not have actually attempted them had there not been some sort of chance that they might have worked. Multiple depositions to New York Governor Henry Clinton showed a disillusioned people. Samuel Wells told one person that if the US declared war on Vermont, then they would be supported by 10 to 15,000 British soldiers from Canada. Of course, Daniel Wells was a loyalist, but there were others. Judge John Bridgman told one individual, quote, that Congress had no business to interfere with the present union of Vermont and New Hampshire. He later told Timothy Church, damn the Congress, curse the Congress. Have we, laid, have we waited long enough on them, a pox on them? I wish they would come to the mill now. I would put them between these millstones or under the water wheel. They have sold us like a cursed old horse. They have no business with our affairs. We know no such body of men. At a pub in Brattleboro, another individual declared, as long as the King and Parliament of Great Britain approved of and would maintain um, would be approved of and would maintain the state of Vermont, he was determined to drive it, and so were its leaders. Another was overheard saying that in less than 24 hours, uh, that it was a start that they would show that in less than 24 hours that it was established by the King of Great Britain. David Lamb spoke about his encounter with a state attorney who complained, We was deceived by Congress. We depended upon a, deci a decision resolution from them because that he talked with three of the members. They told him it was not Vermont's policy to come into union um, with the 13 United States, that they did not determine not to have that they did, did that they did determine not to have anything to do with Congress, for they had strength enough to defend their state and policy enough to regulate their laws of the state. In the years that followed, the Vermonters continued to place their faith in the Arlington Junto, even though there was a rising conservative movement in the state which was caused by an influx of wealthy individuals from southern New England. Over the course of the 1780s, Vermont operated as an independent state that belonged to neither the United States or the Empire. Some would say that they were an independent nation. Foremost, they validated their own lands by giving them themselves the authority to validate their lands. They weren't going to allow either the Empire or the US to take those lands away from them. Tent standoffs between New Hampshire and Vermont and New York occurred that raised the very real prospect of civil war happening. The quote on this slide is from George Washington warning um, Joseph Jones about the prospect of civil war with the Vermonters. As you can see, he says, the country is very mountainous, full of defiles and extremely strong. The inhabitants, for the most part, are a hardy race, composed of that kind of people who are best calculated for soldiers. In truth, who are soldiers? For many, many hundreds of them are deserters from this army who, having acquired property there, would be desperate in the defence of it, well knowing that they were fighting with halters about their necks. They also, the Vermonters minted their own currency, which showed their desire to be a part of a union, of this union with the United States, but the union continually rejected them. Southern states were not willing to have another state which would tip the balance in the favour of the North, again showing an element of this macro-localism. New York continued to be a stubborn roadblock. The numbers of Yorkers slowly drained away as the Vermont government compelled them into submission by harassing them. They repeatedly petitioned Clinton to intervene, but all Clinton could give them was empty words and gestures that left them as disillusioned with New York as Vermont was disillusioned with the Continental Congress. Some took land offered by New York and moved away, but many remained in the state and accepted their fate. Nathaniel Chipman, Isaac Tickner, among other conservatives who later become federalists, slowly gained control of Vermont politics. But they were never able to completely shift those who had been loyal to Ireland in the idea of an independent Vermont. A free trade agreement was signed with Quebec in 86 that provided the settlers with an economic outlet through Lake Champlain and the Richelieu River. Chittenden recorded the highest number of votes as governor in 1790, but he did not meet the threshold. The Conservatives finally had that, their chance to get Vermont into the Union by installing a pro-Union voice as governor, so they duly chose Moses Robinson. He achieved statehood, but he was out again within the year and replaced by Chittenden. The Ratification Convention voted unanimously for statehood, uh, but dissent persisted. 
There were reports of few people turning up to actually elect representatives to the convention, which may mean it was packed by Conservatives. It's said in one of the larger towns, only 19 people turned up to vote for the representative. Ivor Waymont is now part of the union, and it has been ever since. Nevertheless, this didn't stop a sense of localism transcending their nationalism. The majority of Vermonters opposed the War of 1812 because it impacted their trade with the British Quebec. Whilst they were supposed to be at war with Britain, they were also feeding the enemy, leading them to be denounced as rebels and traitors by those outside of Vermont. But the Vermonters do what the Vermonters want, as the George Washington suggested in 1783. And so in 1812, John Adams reflected on the American Revolution and a letter to Benjamin Rush. We were about, he estimated, one for Tories, one for timid, and one for true blue. Vermont was a timid state. There was a fluidity about their allegiance. This doesn't necessarily mean that they vacillated between red or blue, for there were independent states that were operating alongside the Confederation. Each state had their own interests and ideas, and in the earliest years, few, if any, were willing to forsake those for the Union. Arguably, we only look at the political games being played when it came to Vermont's entry to see the different dynamics that were at play elsewhere. Organic states popped up elsewhere in the back countries because people wanted to secure their voice, their land, their futures with the trade. People were more concerned with their own states and regions than they were about this Union. The signs suggest that Vermonters were overwhelmingly patriots, and I won't disagree with that, but I will say that their support had its limits. They supported the American cause so long as it didn't infringe too much on their way of life, on the state that they had created, which enabled them to possess a voice. Once that voice was threatened, they were happy to look elsewhere or go at it alone. Did the Junto speak for the majority of Vermonters when they participated in the Hardman negotiations? Don't think they did, because uh, I don't think the Vermonters were inclined to return to the British. They would have probably put up resistance to that. But this does not suggest that they were steadfastly supporting of the Union, because it appeared the Union was failing them. So they took their destiny into their own hands and they functioned as an independent state for 14 years. And with that, I come to the end of my presentation. And I'd like to thank you again for listening today, or in the case of Scotland, tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Yay. That was a great presentation. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I um I, I heard uh, two names in particular that you mentioned in this presentation that have personal connections to the homestead, the land that is part of our nonprofit museum. Um, I heard you mention William Marsh, who mm -hmm. was a Green Mountain boy at Fort Ticonderoga, but he he's one of the examples you brought up of someone who then switched to the other side and he fought for the British. And yes. kind of that fluidity of allegiance there. Um, well, so some of our participants here might not know, but William Marsh is actually the man who has the the first recorded British land ownership of that land. So he's the first British person to purchase the homestead land. And it's actually, he, he lost that land through the confiscation of the enemies of the state. And it's at, um, it's from then the state of or the Republic of Vermont that the Allen family purchased the homestead land. That's how Ethan Allen got it, because it was taken from William Marsh after he switched sides. Um, oh. A second name that you mentioned that has a personal connection to the homestead is Crean Brush, who was the adopted fa adoptive father of uh, Fanny uh, Montresor Brush Buchanan Allen Pennyman. And the name Allen is in her name because she married Ethan Allen in the 1780s and then moved to the homestead site in 1787. Um, and so, um, and and her story is an example of what you were talking about, how about how Vermont, uh, their policy near the end of the war and, at, and, at, and after the war was really one of just like forgiveness and reconciliation with people of, of all these different loyalties. Um, because Fanny Allen and her family were very much New Yorkers and very much in the British Army, and yet she married, you know, Ethan Allen, who was the rallying point really for the rebels in Vermont. So, an interesting example there too, I think, of of that fluidity of people's allegiances and how localism may have transcended these national arguments. Um, okay, so we are going to open the floor now for Q and A. Um, so, uh, basically, how this is going to work is um, if you um, Benjamin, maybe you could stop sharing your screen so that we could, right, okay. we could see people.
Okay. Okay. So um, if anybody has a question, if you have your video on, you could just physically raise your hand and I can call on you and you can unmute. Or if you um, don't have want to have your video on, you can do use the raise hand function in Zoom. Um, or you could type it into the chat box and put it in the chat box as well. Can I just say, by the way, this is like the most me, the, the most people I've ever presented to. <laughs> it was terrifying. <laughs> Usually I'm used to only one or two people. Okay, I see Sarah has her hand up. Go ahead, Sarah. Well, I'll just try to get the ball rolling by asking how a Scotsman became interested in this aspect of U.S. history which is near and dear to all of us. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, one that I usually always get asked. Um, so my original project was actually on the Loyalist refugees and the return to America after the Revolutionary War. And so I was carrying out like the literature review and I kind of things were working in my mind where I thought, right, if I have to do this project, I'm going to have to go to probably 13 different states, probably go to the Caribbean, somehow get to Canada, you know, somehow get to to the to the, the, the Indies or whatever like that. I thought there's no way I could afford to do that. <laughs> and it'd be tough with regards to funding. So as I was carrying out the, the reading, uh, literature review, I noticed that nobody really was talking about Vermont like I, I remember like Gordon Woods one of Gordon Woods books it's literally just not even a paragraph it's like half a paragraph you get a mention of Vermont and that's it and coincidentally as I was doing that I'd actually been to Vermont in 2010 for skiing in Killington and a photo popped up on my screen um, on my iPad it was like one of those screensaver things um, and I thought you know what What's going on in Ver what's going on in Vermont at this time? Um, let's have a wee look and see what's going on there. And so yeah, that's that's kind of how I ended up getting onto this topic. Um, so originally it was going to be on the loyalists of Vermont, uh, depending on the sources. Came over. Unfortunately, there wasn't too many sources there. But what I have now started to notice was this this idea of localism and this this fluidity of allegiance and looking at how people are dealing with these multiple motivations um, that are running parallel to each other. I also want to ask um, John Devino, who's in the other account that's titled Ethan Allen Homestead in New York. John, if you could just double check your chat box to see if anyone sent you a private chat with a question. Um, I have, I'm looking in my chat box and I um, have a question uh, from Susan. Susan says, sorry, she joined a little late. No problem, Susan, at all. Um, and just a reminder, this is recorded. It'll later be up on our YouTube page so you can catch whatever you missed at the beginning. Um, so Susan is wondering about uh, the fact that this area, like Vermont was, really originally knew France previously and also the role of the indigenous people in France possibly you know in these in these alliances including those people's um ancestors uh or descendants and how did those people make these complicated and fluid choices as the hostilities went forward have you looked at those sources this is Suzanne's question yeah, it's a good question. Um, actually, I've just been rereading the, the a brief. No, it wasn't a brief. No, I've, I've got, I've got, I've got it actually right here. <laughs> I've been rereading it again. I'm forgetting the title of it. Um, it was Ira Allen's. Ira Allen. Which one is it? I think it was some miscellaneous, some miscellaneous remarks by Ira Allen, where he actually makes mention to. New France and the um, the arguments that are put forward by New York, where I believe it was the the Mohawk Indians that lived in that general region, 
I might be wrong there, it was Mohawk Indians generally lived there. And so they claimed that they had jurisdiction over the land um, as the Mohawk came in to the British, I believe. And also that the British had won the land from the new French, which could then extend up into not into Canada and just short of south of um, the St. Lawrence River. Unfortunately, I've not found anything in particular on the French. I've not came across anything like that um, in my studies. I think that might be more might be more something to do with looking into Canada, perhaps, but nothing really of, of note about the um, about the French and the indigenous people in the Champlain Valley. Um, Again, I've not, I've not really found anything in the archives with regards to that or in the, the historical society. If I was able to find something, well, that would be that would be amazing. And I would I certainly have a look again. And even if it meant extending it into having a look in Canada, depending on money and everything, yeah, I'd certainly I'd certainly have a wee look. Um so unfortunately I can't I can't ask the um go too much detail into that one. Um but yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> And I'm going to um, call out somebody who's in the audience here um, to connect you to also. Um, hopefully, Skylar is actually listening and hasn't stepped away. I know that he has a family with young children, so if he stepped away, that would be understandable. But Skylar Bailey is one of the participants here. Um, and Skylar Bailey is actually a descendant of another person you mentioned in your talk, Jacob Bailey from, oh, wow. from Newbury, Vermont. So. Um, uh, Skylar, I don't know if you're actually there at this moment or if you wanted to say anything else about your connection to your ancestor there. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Skylar. Well, I, I may remute there. The two small children you mentioned are just nearby and could start causing mayhem at any moment. So we'll see. Um, yeah. So I was, I was actually, I had a question as well, but um, Jacob Bailey was my sixth great grandfather. Uh, he lived in the town of Newbury, Vermont, and my family remained in that town until the 1920s when my grandfather moved to Burlington. Uh, and we've been here ever since. And I grew up with um, not t a ton of stories about the time period, but certainly a general sense that. Ethan Allen was not such a great guy and not someone that we in the family think very highly of. Um, you know, as you mentioned, they were political rivals at that time. Um, I was curious if there was anything in in your your research or uh, in, in the project in general that you found particularly surprising to you. Um, good question. Um, in general, I mean, this is part of the thing as well as coming from it from an outside perspective. Um, and also my Bajan general background was until because of circumstances out with my control um, leading up to the PhD, this is my first dissertation actually on American history. And the fact that I studied the American Revolution at undergraduate level, but I never had a, I never went totally in depth to it. So this was my first real exposure to pretty much everything American Revolution. And I think as Joan Freeman in her podcast, she talks about this as one of the key things to keep in mind. And one of the things that I'm guilty of to start with um, was you, you tend to see the US as the US, about the 13 colonies, as, as, as maybe what they would have been today, these 13 states, part of a national government, um, and so what really surprised me was actually this sense of localism that really was across the North America. It really was, um, really did splinter the different colonies and the different regions. And it makes it even more impressive that they were actually able to get through and, you know, create this union and then not just create it, but then sustain it as well. Um, so that was probably one of the most surprising thing. It's the central part of my thesis. Um and yeah, I'm kind. I'm kind of surprised a wee bit and how little attention Vermont has received from from historians. To be honest with you, um, because the Northern Frontier was, I mean, I, I'm probably biased here. It's probably quite important to 
in North America in general. You know, the Seven Years' War was based a lot in, in the Lake Champlain, the Champlain Valley, um, you know, and if the British came, that if the British were successful in the Revolutionary War, if Burgoyne got his way, then that could have been game game over before it even began. I did manage to get down and meet um, one of the the Howe brothers in New York. It was luckily it was just because Burgoyne, for some reason, decided to take a different route <laughs> and caught caught out on it. So maybe it was destiny. <laughs> it was meant to be. Well, awesome talk, and I've been really enjoying it. And thanks for your research. Thank you, and thank you for your feedback. I'm glad you enjoyed it. for letting me put you on the spot there. Um, we do have time for one more question. And um, while you're thinking about what your question might be, um, I want to share with Benjamin and with everyone here that Suzanne has added in some, um, some further insight to follow up with her question about uh, French and indigenous peoples um, and how they may have been affected by these allegiance switchings and, and going on. Um, she wrote in the comment box that um, some of the people that she might, she was thinking of particularly that could be studied were families who were stationed in the lake by, by France um, prior to the French and Indian War, as well as Hazen's regiment in the Revolutionary War. Um, and she suggested a book, if anyone's interested in studying these groups of people called Congress's Own by Holly Mayer. Um, which she says it's about Quebec folks who fought for America. And I also thought when the, when uh, you were answering Suzanne's question, the, the only French people I remember you mentioning were those who were with Ethan Allen when he was mm -hmm. captured um, as well. So maybe that could be added to the list as, as another group of people in this demographic. Yep, absolutely. Just to make okay. it even more complicated. <laughs> Not complicated enough. There's not enough sides for people to join and switch between. <laughs> uh, try try studying it all. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we do have time for one more question if there is a question. Um, and then you can also, I'll put the email address for um, the, the museum in the chat box. So if you wanted to email your question, I can always forward it to Benjamin later as well. Okay, um, let me just double check the second screen. So I can't see everyone on one screen. <laughs> so I wanna make sure I'm not missing everyone. Okay, so seeing no more questions at this point then I want to thank everybody for coming to this program. And can you please all help me um, thank Benjamin one more time for his wonderful presentation. Thank you, thank Benjamin, you for joining. Thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. So Ben, if you could just stick on for another minute. Um, and then uh, everyone else, I hope to see you. Um, uh, I hope to see you become members of the museum so you can join us um, on the December ooh, 2nd, 3rd. What is that Saturday? I'm giving the talk. I should know. December 3rd. I'm hoping you can join us for our members uh, only presentation. Thank you, everyone, and have a great holiday week. <laughs>